and this is not in the program. Okay, so I think that we can start. So hi everyone, we are very happy to be here. Uh, as you understood, we are uh, like a backup, but uh, this is a nice chance for us. We we want to tell you, we want to share our experience with you about uh, breaking through large scale Drupal projects uh, with Behead. Uh, we use this tool a lot in our experience, and yeah, here we will share a couple of our cases and uh, a lot of our experience with it. We will try to do that. So first start with some introduction. Uh, here is me, I am Bojidar Boshnakov. Uh, I'm from Bulgaria, working for FDAO agency. Currently I'm area manager in Gabrovo. Uh, this is a whole production unit and also uh, head of QA department. Uh, my responsibilities was to guide all the QAs through the whole projects, to plan resources and to uh, lead every almost every automation activities. Uh, I also have George with me, he will introduce himself. Yeah. Hi guys, can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, nice. So my name is George Tarkov and I'm also from Bulgaria, working in FFW as QA lead currently, uh, focused on automations. And uh, I have more than three years experience already in the company and um, uh, I'm responsible for most of the automation frameworks that are developed in FFW Bulgaria and below are the contacts where we can find us. Yep. So yeah, actually Georgi took my responsibilities over the uh, automation activities and improving the uh, our frameworks and so on. So yeah, uh, he'll, he'll talk about later uh, for to share his experience because uh, he was the main QA lead actually on our, our biggest projects. So, but first of all, I want to show you our agenda to be informed what we are going to, to speak about. Uh, I'll just start with some introduction about behavior driven development. Uh, what is behavior driven development? What is Behat, uh, Gherk and Ming? After that, I'll explain you how we execute our tests uh, because this is a very important part. Uh, I'll speak after this about the Drupal extension and actually this is the main reason we, we chose Behat because uh, it has this very nice Drupal extension with, which helps us a lot. And of course we are on DrupalCon and this is important part. Uh, after that, uh, we'll share, as I said, some of our experience about some common issues that we have. Uh, and if you start working with it, uh, what, may be, what uh, problems you may face in your way to deliver a good automation coverage, uh, how to solve them, and uh, real life examples from our project, what we, uh, what we have as a problems and how we fix them. So, but first of all, I, I just want to start with uh, some, another topic, uh, which is, I want to talk about intelligence. Intelligence, why intelligence? Because most of the people working in our industry are smart. Uh, maybe all of, all of them are smart, but intelligence is uh, a liability. And why is a liability? Because maybe if you are that smart and if you think that you can work without a proper process, this is a problem. Uh, the smart people can make progress. They have too many stuff in their head, they just see it, write code, and uh, they do some things. Maybe if it's a small project or, or a, not that small, but not a big one, they can make a good progress. And this is a good thing. But without a process, we are not able to make a good project, good projects, big projects, uh, projects with large scope, and this is not a good thing. So from what I saw is that uh, many companies think that they have good process, think that they are doing the things in the right way, but I, I faced many, many problems as a quality assurance engineer. Uh, what is my job actually to find problems and to think about how to fix them. And I saw that uh, the process is not uh, implemented in the right way and many, many companies are working because they have smart developers, they have smart engineers and they are delivering their projects because they have the capacity to do it, but with the right process, I think they can improve their work much, much more. So professionals, first design, plan, and prepare. This is very important, and I think this should be always part of our work, and here from the QA perspective, I need to sh share this with you as well, because the QA engineers also need to design, prepare first. This is, this is very important, 
and then do the work. And this actually produces better results and makes it even faster. And this, not all, uh, this is not only for the developers, this is for the whole team. And this is very important for us. And when we are talking about the process, this actually makes a difference between the software engineering and just programming, just coding, which is for me very important and I, I, I need to focus on this one. So when we are talking about uh, process and why, why I was talking about this and why it's important, here are steps in the behavior driven development. Behavior driven development is a methodology. There are many theories, what is it? Uh, some people, many people actually ac accept it in different ways, uh, but it's actually, it could be said like this. Behavior driven development is about implementing an application by describing its behavior from perspective of the stakeholders. This is a, a quote I took from Dan Nort, which uh, this person is meant to be one of the inventors, one of the founders of this uh, methodology. But as I said, there are many people, there are many thinking about the behavior during development, and there are many other quotes that I want to share with you. Maybe a better one and easier for me is this one. Behavior during development is when you e use examples in conversations to illustrate behavior. This one, for me, is much more simpler and actually more true. So this is about the process. This is how we talk with our clients, how we want to build our project, and what we do in order to achieve a better product. And the last one that I like the most is that the behavior during develop, development is about delivering software that matters. Because maybe you saw in uh, your past a lot of graphs that show that actually in our industry, very often we deliver more and more software that uh, is not used at all or it's used uh, not that often. Maybe like uh, 10 or 20% of our systems at our sites are used very often and they are really helpful for the clients and they really improve their business, which is the most important thing. But most of the features, they don't use that often or they don't use at all, which is a huge problem. And in order to follow this process, in order to help uh, in this process as a Q engineers, what we do in order to verify application behavior, as a software developer or as a Q engineer, no matter what, I need tests. We prefer automation tests, of course, because manual testing for huge projects, large scale projects with big time frame, with a big team, of course, manual testing is not enough, never, not, never enough, actually. So what we do, uh, we, first of all, don't go into the coding, don't start working on our automation tests, or start preparing a lot of lines of code which are aiming to uh, capture every bug, to report it to the developers and to say, okay, you, this is not working, you need to fix it, we found the bug, we are great, but this is not the right approach, and we don't want to do this. We are start talking, and we are start talking not with our team, because we think that we got a good communication with our team already established. We start talking with the business, we start talking with the clients, and how we start talking with them, using the language business can understand. Because I saw very often that the business and the development are not talking the same language. Actually, uh, developer is thinking how they can implement something, how they can realize a functionality with their system, with Drupal, for example, and uh, how they can make their work easier if they say, okay, the, this could not happen in this way, you should change it. But the client wants another thing. The client wants his business to be successful. The client comes with an idea, an idea which should change his business, should improve his business, and somehow bring value to all, all, all the, the, they're working. And this misunderstanding in the communication is not a small problem, and uh, we should focus on this one. And here comes the, the QA part where we should start talking to the business, we should start gathering business requirements and help the client and the business to speak more easier with the developers and the team that we are working with. How we do this? We do this with uh, one language called Gherkin. Gherkin is business or business readable language, domain specific, created specially for behavior description, gives you ability to remove the logic details from the behavior tests. So what we need here, we need a language that describes what have to be done but without that coding specific, that details that could make our life harder. 
So Gherkin has a specific syntaxis, as I said, human readable, business language, which is really nice, which the client sometimes partially accepts, but after, after we, we show what are the benefits, I think that uh, every our client accepted that uh, language and our test and they are using them, they are learning from them and they are extending them even, uh, which is really nice in future. And so here I, I gave you one very, very simple example, which I really like, I saw in another presentation, uh, ex describing actually the Gherkin syntaxes. And it's really that simple, as you can see, like we have one feature, one functionality, which is like banana calculator. And we have Bob the banana merchant. And as Bob the banana merchant, I want a calculator that can add bananas so that I know how many bananas I currently have. And this, as you, as you may see, is like a user story, user story in the Java methodology. And it is described in the test. Actually, we took the description of the user story and we move it to the test. And after that, we just create scenarios to test is it working or not. And like this, adding bananas to increase amount I have. For example, we have, uh, given I have three bananas, when I add five bananas, then I should have eight bananas. And actually, it is simple as that. If you have it in the Drupal world too, it is simple as that. I want to buy some product in our web store. As a customer, I walk into the system and I need to be able to add product to the basket. And you can write it in this way, you can write it in this business readable language, and it will work because behind this stands actually a code which is helping us to implement it. Code based on one framework that we are working on and we are working with. This is the BHAT, and this is where BHAT and Wing come in, actually the tools that we, we are going to present today. To you, uh, we are using them and I think that they helped us a lot in, in this mission to actually establish a better process, to be part of the whole project and to improve, I, I, I can say, every part of it because the communication is everything. And when the communication is good and the process is good, everything is good. So this is where Behat and Wing come in. What is Behat? Behat is an open source framework based on PHP, of course. And Behat helps us to automate and to make these tests as you saw on the Gherkin syntax to be like living. They are executable, they are working with this language and they are actually doing what, what is described in the text. So another thing is Mink, another thing is Mink because Mink is very important because Mink is providing us the way to control the browser because we know that uh, our actually our tests, if, they, if we want to be automated, we want to make them from uh, the client perspective, from the customer perspective, what the clients are going to do or what the visitors are going to do. And this is the best way to test the system. Uh, I, I know that there is another test. They are unit tests, integration tests. They are really nice and they are helpful. They are helpful for our developers, first of all, um, but they are not visible for the clients. They are not uh, helping us to see uh, is the user experience good? Is the uh, loading time good, for example, or so, so on? Uh, how many steps are needed in order to buy a product, for example? These unit tests and integration tests don't show this to us. And uh, here we need one framework, one system, one tool, which can give us the ability to test the behavior of the system. And Mink is the one that is controlling our browser, uh, allowing us to traverse the pages, manipulate pages, elements, or interact with them. This is what, what Mink gives us, actually. And here we come on the execution part, how we execute our tests. Because I said that we are using the BHAT framework, which is PHP-based, and of course, we, we choose it because Drupal is PHP-based. Drupal is Symfony already, but okay, uh, our developers helped us at the beginning because I know that in many companies the QAs are no, not that good as developers sometimes, but I think that this is the future and every, and every QA should be at least a half developer. Uh, so at the beginning they helped us, which is, which is really useful for us, and we managed to actually really implement this. Uh, so about the execution, how we execute them, uh, there are, like say, two different ways of execution. 
The first one is headless browser emulators, and the second one is browser controllers. And what is the difference? The first headless browser emulator, and when we want to send a HTTP uh, request and to parse the response of it and to work with, with this response. But as you can imagine, this is this way we can test any JavaScript or Ajax codes. Uh, we can uh, work with the system in, in full capacity, like say it like this. So uh, for a short test that we want to say some, uh, to test something which is not including JavaScript, this is good. We are using it, of course, because it's a lot faster. Uh, and it's not generating, generating a real browser. It is just sending HTTP requests and parse the response. Read it and, yeah, work with it. And the other one is much, much slow. But on the other hand, we have a real browser uh, simulation. We, have a, we need an installed browser, of course, to run it, which is uh, a little bit hard when we want to execute uh, uh, some test on an environment which is not uh, having browser there. But some, somehow, we, we managed to convince the clients and the developers to have this also set up in the projects and to work with the test also and to make them use them to not only the QAs. On every deploy, on every change they make, they are using our test to verify they didn't, they, they didn't break anything older in the previous sprints, for example, or in, like in the last two months because some projects are not for one month, as you know. And especially in our company, we don't have such. Uh, so the other thing, as I said, allows us to test the site as it is with all the JavaScript, with all the J uh, Ajax things, and actually allows us to be like a visitor on the site or administrator and to click on every link or every button and to see what happens and to see uh, how much time do we need and to see how the interactions are happening in real life on the wife side. So what do we use to, to execute this? Uh, this test. The first one is good, only for uh, pure HTTP requests against an application which pass the response that I said and returns the content and work with it. Uh, this driver actually uh, is not supporting browsers, not supporting JavaScript, but it's a lot faster, as I said. Uh, on the other hand, what we are using, we are using Selenium WebDriver, which is actually controlling the, the browser, actually the sessions, cookies, headers management, HTTP authentication, traverse the page, selectors, and manipulate the page. Actually, the Selenium WebDriver supports uh, a whole uh, browser, which is, and allows us to uh, iterate with all elements we see. And another thing that we are using, which is really nice and I think very useful, because uh, sometimes the, the servers that we have and the, the tests that we have are on the servers which don't have graphical interface, and we are not able to run exactly uh, like a web browser, and we are not able to see it or uh, anyway, something like this, some problem like this one. So we are using Phantom GS. Phantom GS is a very interesting technology that is. Uh, growing, I think, and, and uh, it is very useful for us. Phantom GS is a headless web kit, scriptable with a JavaScript API. It has a fast and uh, native support for various web standards, and also allows us to work with the DOM uh, elements, with the CSS selectors, uh, JavaScript, and all other libraries. Uh, and actually, what Phantom GS do is to create us a headless browser emulator. Actually, we don't have real browser running, but it works like we have it. And actually, it's a lot faster, and we still achieve what we want to achieve. And most of the companies, they are using the Selenium web driver. Uh, from my experience, I also used it a lot of years bef before I found this one and before I started using it. And now it is working better and better. Uh, just one note here for Selenium WebDriver, if you, we are using the Chrome driver uh, from the latest versions of Chrome, uh, now the Chrome allows this also this uh, headless execution, which is really nice. Uh, but yeah, PhantomJS is the one that I, I recommend here. So on the interesting part, and actually why we choose uh, Behead, because it has a really nice integration and a really nice extension the Drupal extension. Of course, we are all working with Drupal, and if we have something that could help us in our work and help us to not start from the beginning, what we are usually do if we want to work on some automation package, 
uh, we choose this one because the Drupal extension is very strong. And actually what the Drupal extension gives us, the Drupal extension gives us a lot of things. The Drupal extension gives us work with Drush, work with the Drupal API, uh, work with regions, node types, user roles, taxonomies, and a lot of a lot of elements and a lot of functionality specifically related to Drupal. They are already written. This is like a library. We just extend the VHead framework with this Drupal extension. We got already written functions, uh, what Drupal means to clear cache, for example, what, to, uh, what means to create a node from article content type, what means to create a user, what means to be authenticated or not, and stuff like this. I will show you some examples after this, but. Uh, actually, Drupal extension gives us a lot. Gives us a lot if you want, in order to, to work with, uh, with BHAT and with Drupal, of course. So here are some, some examples. Uh, we can easily, with that extension, we can easily define some regions and to, to create tests like this. You, you saw the, the banana merchant bot, but this is, uh, for example, uh, real cases when for example, I press a button in the header region, and it's as simple as that. Just mark these header regions, add a CSS selector in the configuration, and it's working. And after I press the button and I fill some fields, I can follow links, I can see error messages, uh, and the Drupal extension gives us that, that the system understands now what is error message in Drupal, what is, uh, for example, region in Drupal. And this is really, really useful. Also, it works for nodes. As I mentioned, you can say, given a content type, and I want to create the following nodes with their uh, ID, uh, with the IDs of their fields, for example, title, body, or, the, or whatever you want. And in these easy, easy steps, we can actually generate content on our side. We all know that it's important if we want to use our test in their big ones, we need to clear everything we've created at the beginning. This is important to mention because we aim to not leave any dummy content after us, which is, yeah, uh, which, which could be a problem, just like an advice. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, users, roles, and taxonomies. Again, uh, the Drupal extension gives the Behat the ability to understand what are roles in Drupal, what are taxonomies, and how to create them easily. So, yeah, these are the steps, and uh, from here, after my introduction, we can move to the more interesting part of the presentation, actually, what are uh, our real examples and how we actually worked with BHAT, what problems we faced, because I know that there are a lot of automation tools, I, lot, I know that there are a lot of frameworks, and you maybe heard for all of them, but when we get into the action, it's really, really hard to automate a huge project with only this one with only BHAT, with only Drupal extension, with Mink. They give us a lot, but when we talk in details, when we talk in projects, this is, this is not, uh, not enough. And here, my colleague George will uh, show you some of our experience, some of our projects and what we did. And uh, yeah, this is from me, so yeah, it's George's turn. Okay. So after this uh, really nice introduction to the basics and how we are using and implementing BHAT in uh, uh, our company. I would like to continue with uh, some uh, real case scenarios, how we did it in our projects, what issues we faced, how we managed to fix them, stuff like that. So, of course, we all have problems and we all face them. First of all, I would like to ask you, do we have uh, QA engineers in the room, actually? Yeah? Okay, nice. And uh, you write uh, automation tests, I guess? Yeah, perfect. So you're familiar with our pain. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to mention you guys uh, what common problems and issues we face your our, like, um, how to say, uh, daily work. And first, and the uh, one that irritates most is the badly written HTML and markup at all. It's uh, due to the fact that a lot of developers, um, let's say, sometimes miss uh, CSS selectors. Let's say they don't put IDs on inputs or something like that. Uh, other thing we have is that uh, the tests are being executed in a developed environment. 
it's a perfect case scenario to have a dedicated environment where you can run your tests or have a, a, a site which is built for each build and uh, you run the tests on it. And due to the fact that we have a continuous development on the environment, um, we have a lot of things changing in the functionalities which can cause us uh, test failure. And starting from then, debugging a test failure due to the newly introduced code is a really hard thing to do. And most of the time we have issues with that. Other thing is performance. When you have a large scale project as we uh, mainly doing our company, you start creating automation framework. You just start with a couple of features. Then you add more and add more and add more. And eventually in time you um, get a build which is running for more than two hours only because of the tests and they are really huge and that's actually stopping the whole development process because code can be deployed to development environment, let's say, or staging or production, whatever. So here, that's another issue. And uh, we have uh, dealing with third parties. That's uh, something we faced a lot in our projects and it's uh, really irritating to uh, try to automate something that you don't have control of. Of. Because in the case of missing IDs or bad markup, you just can say to the developer, hey, I, I need this ID here, so this, the process is really faster. But when you have a third party which you don't have control on, you just can do nothing. And of course, a lot more issues that can bring us on a daily basis. But uh, from the previous side, uh, slide, we learned a lot of lessons. Uh, facing all these issues, we of course try to uh, solve them because you can't proceed with your work if you don't solve all the issues listed before. And uh, for me and for my team, I think the most uh, important thing is to keep uh, really good communication with your development team. Like I said already, you can go to them and say, hey, I have a problem here, can you help me? Or like Bujidar said, that you can, uh, they can help you with setup for environments, for behead overall and stuff like that. And uh, of course they can make really small changes to the functionalities, let's say. If you want to, let's say, register on a website which have a one-time login link, that's a sent through email. And if you want to do that, you need to go to an email client, uh, catch the link, uh, go to the website with that link, blah, blah, blah. But the fastest thing is a developer can expose that link on a web page, which is specifically, let's say, developed for automations, which was the case in one of our projects I'll show uh, later. And yeah, keeping the connection and being really close to the development thing is the, is the most important part, I think. The perfect thing to have is a dedicated environment for tests. That happened a couple of times in our company. We are trying to uh, do it like a must, but it's, uh, uh, so far it's, uh, that's not the case. But we have it, and it's a really nice thing. Because uh, when you say you do a deploy from devel to development environment, firstly you do a deploy to the testing environment. You run all your tests, there, if everything passed, everything is green, we can proceed and deploy this code to the development environment, saying that we will have a really strong bug-free development environment, which can be, let's say, uh, deployed on stage and production each day. And the last thing that I mentioned uh, is that we need to separate the suits. I mean, suits, uh, those are the big packs of automation tests that are specific for uh, different functionality. And uh, what we did is uh, we separate the tests based on how important they are. For instance, we have one small package which is based on the really business critical functionalities and we run that on each build. And running that on each build allow us to verify that, for instance, if you're selling some products, you still can buy a product. The, this uh, product flow is not broken. Other thing that we do is nightly builds, nightly builds and nightly automation runs 
which they uh, cover a lot, a lot more of the functionalities of the website. And uh, yeah, this thing can help you. Firstly, giving you a better, uh, like a stronger environment, and uh, also giving you faster builds because all the times you are pushed, let's say from project manager or from clients, I want to see this part of the code on production, I want to see it working. But if you have like a two hours suite of automation tests running, you can deliver that that much, uh, that fast. And here, uh, I would like to present you some real case scenarios on projects that we work on. And what actually what we have next is a couple of the hardest things that we face during our work or how the business likes to call them simple projects. First of all, we have uh, the Wush. It's a retail cosmetic company. Uh, it's a really huge platform which is based on nine different Drupal instances, a Symfony one, and uh, mobile applications for Android, iOS. All of them working together, all of them sharing data through mobile, uh, to, through APIs and services. Meaning that you have, uh, for a start, a really, really huge platform to build on. And um, we managed to roll out this platform for 17 different countries on 15 different languages. So, you can imagine how you need to check the error message, which is uh, I wasn't able to create the note on 15 different languages. That's that's really hard thing to do. And a uh, couple of the Drupal instances that I mentioned above are only backend, meaning that there's no front end. You need to iterate only with the Drupal administration, which uh, I will show how we actually face these challenges and how we actually solve them. So uh, here we have the uh, challenges listed. And overall, as I already said, planning the whole automation framework on this huge platform <laughs> by itself is a really hard thing to do and it's really challenging. And of course, uh, we achieve that by spending a lot of time thinking about the, the future implementation in the future uh, functionalities that are going to be added. Because in this case, adding one small new feature can break your automation architecture like completely. Because introducing something in the middle, uh, in the, let's say, uh, flow that you're buying a soap, it's really different to, to do. And what we did here is actually uh, built uh, one architecture and we like change it due to iterations, let's say during the sprints or uh, during a couple of months because it was needed. It's it's not like uh, one thing, it's comp uh, and changing uh, constantly. And of course, managing all that websites and their profiles because uh, one thing uh, Bujdar didn't mention is that you can build a different profiles for each website. Let's say you have uh, three different websites and you can predefine their uh, URLs, their basic authentication, you can predefine, let's say, root access, and you can use that easily in uh, Behat. Say it, something like, I want to be logged in, and that will walk, in, uh, walk you in in a specific website. So it, the system to know which specific website you need, you need profiles. and to have a profile per environment, per site, and per uh, country, it was a uh, really hard thing to do. And also you have per profile. So we have 17, uh, we have three environments, 17 countries, and nine profiles. It's a really large scale one. And we actually managed to do it. How we managed to do it? We introduced uh, a chain of uh, YML files, that's where the Behat uh, configuration is stored. We have uh, uh, separated, as I said, per country, uh, per environment, per country, and per profile. And uh, we uh, added a lot more attributes to the profiles, which can help us uh, 
test uh, simultaneously both the, the Drupal website and the mobile applications. For instance, we store things like uh, tokens, so we can call some uh, requests in the mobile API and we already like have a generated token, so we can store that in the profile and easily access it after that and whenever it's needed. Other thing is that the, uh, most of the, pro the profiles were with uh, backend. We, uh, here we developed a specific uh, context, which we are going, it's still in development, but we are going to introduce soon to the Behead community and the community overall. It's uh, a specific one working only with Drupal administration. It makes it easy to navigate through uh, to Drupal menus and also give you ability uh, to do other stuff really, really Drupal specific. It's built on the Drupal extension. We like uh, get some ideas from it and tr try to improve it and to see what's in uh, fitting our cases. And we use it here in, in Wash. And the last thing, oh no, it's not the last thing. Uh, the next one is uh, creating the tests that work simultaneously with web and mobile. Uh, the interesting part here is that we uh, should have, like, let's say, the same products uh, simultaneously on websites and mobile applications. And if you want, you can buy it from the website, you can buy it from the mobile application, and the flows should be absolutely the same. And uh, the communication between the website and the mobile application should work constantly. For instance, your authenticating in the mobile uh, application, but you need to have a Drupal user to do it. So there's a talking between the website and the application. And for that uh, meaning, there's a lot of custom work that we uh, did. So we can crawl the application, we can crawl what's the uh, what's the data coming through the APIs capture that and after that uh, compare it, let's say, to Drupal data and compare if the user IDs are the same, compare that the basket is uh, not empty and stuff like that. And we had a huge migration because uh, Wush, they got a website which was already built on Drupal. It was Drupal 7 to Drupal 7 migration, but it was like uh, more than uh, 15,000 nodes which were uh, from a couple of different content types. And uh, the good thing that we faced here is that uh, while we were doing the Drupal 7 new, uh, the new Drupal 7 website, we had the old one still running and we have a dedicated server for it. So we, we were able to easily compare old data to newly migrated data and we built automation uh, a framework for the migration, which was like uh, going to one website, crawl all the information that is located in the node, and after that, uh, compare it to the newly migrated one in our new system that we built. Mm -hmm. Okay, so other project that we worked on is for a world reading uh, agriculture company. Here we have the almost, uh, let's say, the same scenario because we have a multi-site setup with a lot of countries and a lot of languages. And what we did here for the lot of languages, uh, a colleague of mine uh, introduced us to, the, uh, to a newly developed extension which is called the multilingual extension. You can follow the link. Uh, that's easily allow us to have uh, different languages and strings defined on different languages. And for instance, uh, you can say something like, I would like to verify this error on all languages. And that will compare the, uh, uh, sorry, that will compare the, the string on English. After that, switch the website to Dutch look at a Dutch, change it to Bulgarian, look at it in Bulgarian, stuff like that. And Or you can say something specific like, I would like to see, uh, I would like to check this error message in English and that will pick, or any other language, and that will pick a specific language out of the uh, YAML files that are configured and compare the strings and give you the results. 
which uh, like uh, give us a lot more time to do like other stuff. I mean, this uh, this feature allows us to have uh, concentrated on other things in the project and fixed a lot of our issues that we had so far. Uh, other thing that I mentioned earlier is the one-time login links. It was uh, an issue before, but we have developed a feature in the Drupal meaning of feature we can, which can be easily like turn on and turn off. Uh, for instance, is our automation tests uh, were uh, doing the stuff that they go first on the website, enable that feature, and do the rest of the testing after it. And after the content is cleared, after the users are deleted, which we're using, so we don't leave any dummy content on the website, we turned off the feature. And that's leaving the environment as as it was before. Uh, and the uh, last thing that I want to mention here is a, a really interesting CSV imports that we're we're doing. We are actually importing nodes through the CSVs, but uh, the unique he uh, thing here was that UADs for each nodes uh, needs to be like you know random strings, and actually we didn't have that in the beginning. So we, each time we run any automation test, we receive the CSV from the uh, clients, which was uh, with not generated uh, UADs. So we generated them uh, automatically and imported them like a new column in the CSV. And after that, we save it and upload it in our system, which was uh, like uh, we faced a couple of tricky things during the uh, during that process. And of course, like we we tried to do that, so you can have a like um, really uh, independent uh, tests. So you can say each time you can run uh, with no matter what CSV. You don't need predefined data in it. It can it can be generated automatically and random. Mm. The other company and the other problems that we faced was for a telecommunication company. And uh, first thing we have here is a two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication was a really hard uh, thing to manage. And imagine having a lot of automation flows that will, have, that will visit uh, third-party websites that you don't have control of and the two-factor authentication is based on a third party, and uh, this third party can be changed on a daily basis, a lot of content is added to it, or something different which makes your uh, work like re really, mm, really hard, let's see. Uh, other thing is that we have JSON files, but the tricky part here is that the JSON part, uh, files were encrypted and they were on remote servers we don't, which we don't have access to. And here, actually, how we saw that is uh, uh, something that I mentioned earlier, keeping really good communication with the development team. So we went to our development team, say, hey, we, we are not able to manage that by ourselves. Can you help us somehow? And again, we uh, introduced that uh, feature in Drupal feature, automation feature. When this one is turned on uh, and you visit a node which are supposed to receive this encrypted uh, JSON file and store it there, we have that exposed in the backend. So there's on node edit, there's a different tab on the top uh, that say, uh, says, let's say, automation. And on this tab, you can receive the JSON file. And after that, start growing the, the website and comparing JSON data with the website data. And uh, uh, due to working with a lot with uh, JSON, we built a couple of, uh, uh, let's say, <laughs> more than a couple of steps that are doing comprehension between uh, these data. And uh, uh, we built an uh, extension which is uh, allowing, allowing us to have different parts of code introduced to the system during runs. That's uh, PHP traits. 
and we use the traits to have different parts of code like plugged in during the execution of the tests. And here, Bojdar would like to say a few more words. So yeah, and yeah, after all these examples, if you didn't understand, all this happened with Behead. Because, uh, yeah, Georgi didn't mention it, but uh, every, all of these problems we, we managed to fix with Behead. Uh, and at the beginning, when we chose Behead, of course, it was not that easy. We didn't have all these things. We, when we receive a huge project, as, as he said, with many environments, with many different countries, we, we, were not able, we were not capable to do this with Behead. But we extended Behead. We contributed as much as we, we could. Now we are continuing contributing on it, and of course, Behead is open source, PHP based. Uh, it's free, <laughs> which is very important, and <laughs> one of the reasons why it's free. Uh, we continue using it, and we think it's very powerful too. These are the main reasons, uh, actually, we saw. And uh, after all this experience we got with it, after all these uh, completed successful projects with the huge packages, uh, that I'll repeat again that our clients are using as uh, some sometimes as actually manuals and documentations to educate their editors how the site is working. Actually, they're using these steps to, for example, if they uh, forget how one of their functionalities is working because we have such cases. I don't, I, 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 I'm not sure did you have such case, but we have cases when our clients forget how some of their functionalities are working and they're asking us from backend perspective how they sh could, for example, build that block or build that view. And they're using also the test as a documentation, as a education materials, and they're extending them. They're asking us for a trainings how they can extend their tests in future if they continue the development or if they want to cover more and more. And yeah, uh, so, so this, is happening with Behead, and uh, this is the reason why we, we made this presentation, and why we're working with it. And of course, everything that uh, Tarkanov mentioned uh, could, be, uh, could be shown to, to you and to the community. It's uh, all there in the internet, or you can contact us, so yeah, feel free if you, if you want to try it, or if you have any problems, we, we are here to help. Uh, so yeah, uh, this, is, this is the reason why. This is the answer to the, the question why, yeah. Yeah, I'll answer this one. So we have both scenarios, actually. We run tests uh, uh, on separate environments, which are dedicated only for tests, and run them against a development environment, staging environment and production. But uh, what we have the case uh, currently is that we have, uh, uh, as you said, a Docker container, which is built on uh, with Jenkins, and tests are run on this Docker container on the environment there, and if as I said, everything is green. We deploy that to a, a development server. And, and uh, if uh, the second question comes, where, uh, how do you handle the sample content? Because you need to populate the page somehow. Do you get the data back then from the other side? Or is it generated through the Google Apps? The best case scenario is that we have like a, a sanitized uh, database that it's uh, from production. So we have some real data, but it's Sanitize, and we try to use that. Or in other cases, the Drupal extension can easily provide you some random strings and fill you a couple of nodes which you can use for the functionalities. And from my perspective, the best way is to create it by the behead tests. At the beginning, you have a, like a preconditions feature, which is actually uh, creating the content that you need in your automation package because uh, the, the way of creation is, it is simple, but many times we face problem with the most simple functionality. Sometimes the client reports that they are not able to save and to create an article, for example, which is a very basic and straightforward thing. But I think that the best way is in the, to have a preconditions which is generating us this content from the behead steps, from steps, from tests. And after that, of course, as Trakanov said, also to delete the, the content because we should not leave any dummy content on the environment. Yeah, this is.
if this answered your questions. Okay, so yeah, uh, join, join us for the contribution sprints at Friday. And of course, thank you. And if you have any questions, we are here. So thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed our session. And if anyone has any questions, or, okay. So uh, one problem that we face in our company is that the uh, person writing the tests is constantly frustrated because one of the developers changed the function, which is good because the client requested it. But the problem is that the development team is about eight people. And then the, the person writing the tests has to go to every single of them if they can't figure out themselves who it was. So uh, you mentioned good communication is key. Um, but so far, uh, we haven't managed to, to get a workflow that really helps the developers tell the test engineer to, this is now changed. And yeah, because the test engineer is sometimes not in office. And uh, so you can imagine uh, this frustration from my point of view, has to go away. So, yeah, so true. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the question. It's, uh, it's really, really a uh, life example. It, this is happening. And uh, uh, as we said, the key uh, for this to, to be successful uh, is the communication. But uh, not only between the developers and the QAs. As I started from the beginning, we should talk to the business. Business should understand how much it costs to change something when we already started or we already developed it. Uh, when they are thinking about the change request or where, when they are thinking about uh, what they need to improve, which will change a lot of functionalities, they, they should know that if you want to make it, we want to spend not only developer hours, but we should spend a lot of QA hours. And uh, they should be aware of the resources that they have if you say one develop, uh, seven developers and one QA engineer, which is, yeah, a big problem many times, we, we got it also. And uh, I think that if the client is aware uh, how much it will cost and uh, w what will be the result of this, because if you change it, the whole automation package is not working, the QA should rework it. Yeah, of course, all, all this. Uh, they, sh they could be more careful because they are not <laughs> always that careful and they always want to change something, and this is of course acceptable. We can't say to the client, don't change this or don't change anything. This is, uh, this won't happen in the real life, of course, but if they know how, it, how important it is to, to define the, uh, the descriptions at the beginning and to the user stories better at the beginning, uh, they, they will, like, this will be reduced. The times that you change your tests will be reduced uh, drastically. And also what we are doing, actually, uh, we are at the beginning of the project, one of our QAs, uh, which is more like business analyst, instead of automation engineer, is sitting close to the, the client and help them define the user stories and the acceptors criteria. And this is very important. This is something that is missed very often on the discoveries and the early project phases. Uh, we need that person. We need someone who is technical enough to know how it's going to be implemented, but to be business oriented, to help them actually realize what they really want. Because with the experience, maybe you already done a lot of projects similar to this one, you can give ideas and you can say, okay, we had project like this. And for this project, in future, we got these problems and the client wanted this to be changed. So maybe at the beginning, think about this. Yeah, let's make it like this. So we will not spend that much time in future and you won't pay for change requests that much in future because they care for their business and for their budget and for their scope, of course. And if we care about their budget, scope and business, they will be happy to work with us and they will listen us. And yeah, this is, this is the most important thing that, that I, I, this is the key to success for, for me and from my point of view. But you always have these situations when you uh, rework a lot of tests. <laughs> this is actually, this is the real life. Yeah, thank you. Okay.